All right, thanks very much. Um, so I'm gonna talk today about sort of my perspective, both as a researcher who shares data and somebody who runs a, a data repository. So we, you know, we've been sharing data for more than a decade now, and we first built a repository called OpenFMRI. We do uh, brain imaging research in my lab. We had a, a number of data sets we wanted to share, and so and we also wanted to kind of help others share. So we started this platform, launched it in 2010, and it sort of you know grew relatively slowly. And one of the big challenges we had was curation. So we had um, you know come up with sort of a uh, homemade you know ad hoc uh, framework for data organization. This is our schematic of it, and we would we'd give this to researchers and say, "Can you get your data to look like this?" And then you know send it to us, and we'll curate it to to make it work. And um, we didn't actually have an automated way to validate it. So we'd have to sort of run it through our software and see if it crashed. And if it did, we'd tweak it. And so we um, that clearly was not a, a, a scalable model for data sharing. So we had an opportunity back around 2014 um, to uh, obtain some funding initially from the Lauren John Arnold Foundation to basically try to sort of you know update this platform. Um, and we we called it Open Neuro because we wanted to expand the types of data that we were uh, bringing in. Um, and one of the things that when we, we ended up launching it in 2017, we started working on it a couple of years before that. And one of the really important things that we saw was the need to kind of simplify curation and particularly for us, you know, in the context of this sustainability issue that was that was mentioned in the last talk, you know, we just couldn't afford to hire a bunch of curators to get people's data in shape. And so we wanted to basically push curation back on the users. And so we um, we put together a, a group and held a, a number of meetings um, with support from the INCF to develop something that we ultimately call the Brain Imaging Data Structure, or BIS, which is a standard for organizing neuroimaging data, based for both for file organization, file naming, and for metadata. And uh, one of the essential aspects of this standard is um, that we wanted to basically have it be kind of centered on an automated validator. So we built a JavaScript validator that can run in the browser and you know, very quickly tell somebody whether their data set is or is not a valid bids data set. Um, and then what we were able to do is basically build this validator into Open Neuro. So now when someone wants to upload it and share a data set, the first thing they have to do is basically run their data set through the validator. And this is prior to upload because it runs in the browser on the client side. Um, and you know, in this case, it says, hey, there's some warnings, but it passes. Once it passes, then the data can basically be uploaded and be immediately shared. And it's greatly reduced the need for uh, curation on our side, which you know, we, makes it much more scalable. Um, this is uh, just showing how much data has been shared um, on the platform over the last three years. Um, and you see, we've had a, a really sort of, you know, sustained growth in the number of data sets now, well over 500 data sets with data from about 17,000 individual subjects at this point. Um, and so, you know, we think that that this, this move towards kind of, you know, auto curation on the part of the users has been um, really effective. Um, so, as a researcher, what are the main challenges? You know, we've already heard this, right? It's incentives. Like uh, researchers don't feel like um, they are adequately rewarded for data sharing activity. Both, you know, rewarded for the time they have to spend, um, and and also don't necessarily, you know, receive funding to pay for the time that needs to be spent. Though, you know, one of the benefits of the brain imaging data structure is, you know, when labs, a number of labs, you know, well over 100 labs around the world have now moved to this being their, their kind of native standard for data organization in the lab, because it's built, it's built around what researchers were already doing in their laboratories. Um, and, um, and so it's not that big of a lift to, to move to using this, uh, this standard. In addition, you know, a number of the, um, the, the tools that are used for archiving data that come off of an MRI scanner can export straight into the bid standard. And so, you know, one of the things we, we like to do is, you know, highlight for researchers that, you know, when you think about data sharing, um, it's not just sharing with other people. It's also sharing with yourself in the future. You know, when a new postdoc comes into the lab and wants to work with a data set that was collected a couple of years ago, if those data aren't, you know, well, well organized and well formatted, um, that's, you know, that, that's a challenge, right? And so, you know, using the, even if you never share it with anybody else, sharing it with future you or future postdocs or students is a, is a, a meaningful advance. 
Um, but we, you know, I, I think that the big challenge that remains is is sort of, in, you know, changing the incentives around hiring and promotion and tenure to to recognize both data sharing activities and to recognize, you know, research that's um, that's based on shared data. I think in our particular field of brain imaging, you know, I, I, I can, you know, tell you a number of examples of individuals who now have gotten jobs where all of their research was based on shared data. So I think that, you know, we're moving towards that sort of ecosystem, at least in our field. And I think we need to figure out how to, how to make that sort of work more broadly. Um, now, you know, I run a researcher driven repository and obviously, um, you know, there, there are also, you know, repositories that are run by institutions and, and government agencies. I think that there's a, a strong need. Obviously, we need, uh, you know, institutional repositories, but I think we also need researcher driven repositories um, in part because of the flexibility they offer us. So we, for example, in Open Neuro, we share all of our data right now are shared under a public domain dedication. That means that anybody can take the data and do whatever they want with them. Obviously, they need to be de-identified. Um, but you know the we have the flexibility to do things um, that uh, that a federal agency or an institution often won't be able to do because of the the higher standard of of sort of regulation and legal oversight that they are subject to. So I think that these types of uh, repositories are definitely important. The challenge, it, as we actually just heard in in um, the previous talk, is around sustainability. You know we. Um, We've historically kind of sort of supported our grants through, you know, three year, sorry, supported our repository through sort of, you know, three year grant periods. And that's just not a sustainable way to run a repository. We've been lucky to obtain funding from the Brain Initiative most recently, which has an entire program that's centered on funding um, data archives with, you know, five year grants. So we're three years into a five-year grant. We'll have the opportunity to apply for at least one more round of that. So that's a, a much better model for sustainability, but it still remains challenging for sort of researcher-driven repositories to, um, to be able to, you know, give the kind of guarantees that you that one wants, um, you know, for, for data. And so the other thing that we're doing is working with our institutional repository at Stanford to... Um, to try to be able to basically offer them as a backstop such that if we go away, the data will still live in that repository. Um, so finally, I just wanna thank the folks who've worked with me on this and uh, thank you.